environment. A super committee has been set up to deal with the budget deficit. The report is supposed to come out in by around Thanksgiving time. Super committee, 12 members, six Democrats, six Republicans. Uh, later at afternoon speaker, Johnny Isaacson, you may want to pose a question to him about what's going on related to the super committee. But the super committee, in trying to tackle the U.S. budget deficit, is probably considering mortgage interest deduction as one of the items to shave in order to raise revenue. It's a possibility. Once the super committee comes out with the report, it is not a law. It will need to be passed at both chamber of Congress. So both chamber of Congress either will accept or reject. No amendments, just straight yes or no. And if it's no, then something called automatic triggers gets put in where there will be a lot of spending cuts from 2013, including a sizable cut in the defense spending. So there's a lot of angle that is at play in this uh, highly uncertain environment. Um, and right now, what is needed, clearly, for everyone in the country is additional jobs. Because job is clearly the source of everything, including the housing demand. And the recovery right now is very, very sluggish. And I want to go over several slides with you. Uh, is hopefully that some of the slides you can actually use with your clients uh, in demonstrating here are the factual information. People can think about all information because remember informed consumers are usually the best consumers uh, out there uh, and use the information. This PowerPoint, uh, let me ask Reggie, well, will be available through the website through the um, Atlanta Board of Realtors. Uh, so let me just go uh, to the slides. First, this is the annual home sales in the U.S. The green bar chart is the actual tally, and the blue is what would be the best bidding line, assuming there is no fluctuation. Real estate is a cyclical business, up and down, so it never moves in a straight line. But assuming that job growth was constant, mortgage rate never changed, consumer confidence remained the same, well, there's an increase in population each year. Every year there's an increase in population, so one would expect that home sales will be steadily rising. During the bubble years, they clearly overshot. Many people who are not yet ready to become homeowners became homeowners through lax underwriting standards. So we, one sees that it overshot the historical trend line. Subsequently, hard landing crash, it landed down. But one can clearly see that right now it is underperforming in relation to what could be normal. It's underperforming in relation to normal. So the question is, when will it break out, meaning that it will return back to the trend line? Is it going to be later this year? Is it going to be early next year? Or do we have to wait two years from now? But right now we are underperforming in relation to what it could be. This is the monthly data, not the annual data, and one sees much more fluctuation in the monthly data. Uh, so one sees a huge boom during the housing market bubble, huge downturn, very low sales activity, and the home buyer tax credit, led by Senator Isaacson, uh, triggered buyers to come back into the market. Even though unemployment rate may be 9% or 10%, that still implies that 90% of the workforce have job and they are in a position to respond to incentives. And we see that people responded to the home buyer tax incentives. So there was a surge. Deadline was approaching, I think in November of, uh, I forget the November, but it subsequently got it extended. So we saw the second surge occurring in the spring of last year. But the second surge was not as strong as the first surge, implying that the people who would respond to the tax credit were thinning out. They have already used up thinning out. So finally, tax credit ended, and after the tax credit ended, naturally, sales slumped deeply. That's expected. People want to take that $8,000, they don't want to wait a couple of months later. But look what happened after the tax credit ended. It steadily began to rise on its own power. Not in a very robust way, but still it was rising on its own power before recent three, four months when it began to slide back down again. So it was rising on its own power before the slippage of the past four months. By the 
that slippage? Well, the economy is slipping our soul. This is the measurement of total production in the, in the United States. Average would be 3%. So every year, America produces 3% more every year on average. After a sharp recession, to compensate for the downturn, you need to produce not 3%, but something like 4 or 5% more just to compensate for the downturn. So that green line shows what is the, should be happening after a recession. But one sees that we are far below that level of production. So the growth rate right now is less than 1%. Very, very sluggish economic expansion, which is the cause of concern, cause of anxiety, and lack of consumer confidence is leading to lower home sales slippage that we've been, been seeing in the recent months. So the economy is slipping, housing market is also slipping. Question, what about an economic stimulus? And the answer is definitely no at this time. And the answer is no because first, regarding fiscal policy, this is from Congress and the administration, there's no money to spend. Deficit, 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 there's no money to spend. Further spending, further stimulus may cause a further downgrade in the uh, credit ratings. Right now, in the first downgrade, it did not impact the market. The bond investors, the global bond investors, whether from China, Germany, uh, teachers' pension fund, they're saying, okay, the standard of course downgraded America, but we don't believe in standard of course. We want to invest in something that is comfortable, and we still believe in the U.S. Treasury, so they continue to invest, uh, which is the reason why mortgage rate continues to remain very low, which is tied to the Treasury. But if there, could be, if there is a further, larger increases in the deficit, there's no guarantee that the bond investors will feel comfortable. So right now, fiscal stimulus, there's nothing left in the tank, so that is not really a possibility. State and local governments, interestingly, they have a rule in their books to say you have to balance the budget. So as a result, state and local government are actually doing counter stimulus, meaning that they're actually cutting jobs uh, in the process uh, because they have to balance the budget, the revenue is not coming in, they have to slash spendings. Um, the potential increase in taxes, uh, from the real estate point of view, what we are monitoring very carefully is whether or not they are going to try to take away mortgage interest deduction or at least some portions of the mortgage interest deduction. We know it's under discussion. We are, uh, sure, we are constant, in constant communication with the congressional staff, we meaning the, the National Association of Realtors uh, and, the, and everyone involved in the real estate to assure the mortgage interest deduction, which has been in place for 100 years, for 100 years, do not get touched. Uh, but given the budget situation, they are looking into it and they are saying, well, we will not touch for the middle class, but we may touch for second home purchases. We may touch for millionaires and billionaires. The definition of millionaires and billionaires are people who are earning about $200,000 and over. So, but, but we will see what will uh, occur regarding the mortgage interest deduction and look very, very carefully. Regarding monetary policy stimulus, interest rate that the Federal Reserve controls. Federal Reserve does not control mortgage rates, by the way. They have no control over the mortgage rates. They can only control something called Fed funds rate, short-term interest rate. It's already at zero. Can it go below zero? No. So even from a monetary policy point of view, there's nothing left in the tank for additional stimulus. But one additional possibility is something called quantitative easing. And you say, what is quantitative easing? Well, that's called expanding Federal Reserve balance uh, sheet uh, at the Federal Reserve. You say, what the heck is that? Simple language, print a lot of money and hand the money over to the U.S. Treasury. Well, that in the short term may work, but everyone sort of says, oh, how can there be a free lunch? Just print, print money and uh, can we have a free lunch? Well, we know that there is no free lunch. Eventually, that could be a potential cause, and the cost is in forms of depreciating dollar uh, and higher inflation. So, even the quantitative easing potential is no longer possible. Current
think that Chairman Ben Bernanke is scheduled to make a speech tomorrow where he will mention whether there will be another round of quantitative easing or not. If there is, I would say the impact would be very, very minimal for the real estate because mortgage rate today are about 4.3, 4.4 on average. Assume the mortgage rate, which is not tied to the Fed action, by the way, but assume that it does decline, somehow it does decline to 4%. Is that really going to be a game changer for the consumers, going from 4.4 to 4%? And I would say that probably not. What's going to be truly game changer is really about getting the underwriting standard back to normal. Right now, it's overly strange that many people want to take out 4.5% mortgage rate or even 5% mortgage rates, but they are being denied a lot. So it's not the mortgage rate really that matters at the current situation, it's about the underwriting standards. But tomorrow, there will be some uh, speech by Ben Bernanke, and we will see whether there will be quantitative easing or not. But however he says it, I think the impact will not be that meaningful for the real estate. But the concern of potential higher inflation down the line, no, that's a possibility. State and local government, trimming, as I mentioned, balance budget, the rules, they have to slash. Federal government, there's no balance budget rule, so they can spend, spend, and spend. And one of the things they have been doing is hiring federal employees as part of the expanding government agencies, new uh, consumer protection uh, agencies, uh, and many others. Um, so, but this is topping off. There's no further money to spend, so they cannot increase further uh, related to this. Monetary policy, the red line is the Fed funds rate. That's what the Federal Reserve controls. Federal Reserve does not control the mortgage rate, which is the blue line. One sees the Federal Reserve can raise interest rate, lower interest rate regarding the red line, but the blue line really do not necessarily change all that much. So again, what Federal Reserve will say tomorrow, I don't think it's going to be that meaningful for the real estate market at all. That could be a potential cause in terms of higher inflation uh, in the future. A lot of printing the money, consumer price inflation is rising. People receiving social security checks for the past couple of years, zero cost of living adjustments. Sometime in November, December, there will be an announcement about new cost of living adjustment for social security recipients. And my estimate is that it's going to be something about 3.5%. So people who are receiving social security check next year, you will be protected from this rising inflation. But most workers will not be getting that 3.5%. Most workers' salary will be rising only 1% or 2%. So most Americans will be falling behind. Inflation is rising faster than wages. People on commission, you know, it moves all over the place. So, so, uh, but the higher consumer price inflation uh, will lead to some protection for the seniors, uh, but no less protection for most workers around the country because of the so much printing of the money now beginning to filter into the consumer price inflation. Home sales in Georgia, the state of Georgia. Atlanta, I believe, comprises about 70% of the state of Georgia uh, in terms of population in you know, greater uh, uh, state. So I'm assuming that Atlanta is uh, pretty much the heavy player in terms of state statistics. One see the boom years, the down years, home buyer tax credit, and also one sees that in recent quarters there's some activity recovery. Not the prices, but transactions. At least people are coming into the market, they're seeing some good bargain prices, and one sees some increased transaction. And some of you may have actually already begun to notice that so you are more busier than ever, a short sales process, so many forms to fill out, then the banks, they may respond, they may not respond. Uh, so you are working twice as hard as before, but when you look at your commission check, uh, it's still lower than possibly even last year, uh, because even though there's an increased transaction, it's occurring at a lower prices. But at least the buyers are coming in, and this is the first necessary step for housing market recovery. You need buyers coming in, absorb inventory, and once the inventory steadily thins out, that's when you get back to normal. 
So the first step to recovery is buyer some sort of inventory, and you are beginning to see some aspect of that. I mean, we need much, much more buyers in the market, but at least some aspect of that is already beginning to occur. New home sales, newly constructed, no recovery whatsoever. In fact, I did not even respond to the home buyer tax credit. And sometimes media report to say that no one is buying a home, no one is buying a home, with a subtle message, you should not be buying a home either. But that's a wrong message, because new home sales are not moving because builders are not building. If you build only 10 homes, at maximum, you can only sell 10 homes. You cannot sell 30 new homes. The, so, the, so the fact that the new home sales are so low is because builders are not building. And you ask the builders, why are you not building? And they have a couple of answers. One, they said, well, we don't want to compete with foreclosed properties. If we produce, we have to uh, discount it, and before you know it, all the profits disappear, therefore we cannot produce. Some builders are saying they have their market niche. If they produce, they have a client. They go to bank for construction loan, bank says, sorry, no construction loan for you. Because if we do a construction loan, the regulators will be all over us and may even shut our bank down. So therefore, even the builders who want to build, they are being constrained due to the lack of construction loan, which is the reason why new home sales is not moving, because builders are not simply building. Whatever they're building, it's been eaten up, because inventory level of new homes is at about 40 year low. Existing home inventory is still high, elevated, and for closed property, many distressed property on the market is still high, but newly constructed home inventory is at a 40 year low. Greater Atlanta metro market, housing construction activity. Look at the past three years compared to what it had been. Builders are not just building anything. One good news to view this is that it's going to help manage, manage inventory much quicker, the broader inventory. So less inventory is being added to the market. But also, no, Atlanta typically is the fastest growing metro market in the country. You go to New York, very slow expansion. In fact, many New Yorkers move out of New York once they reach retirement age or if they have another opportunity. Same thing in Chicago. Same thing in uh, many markets. But Atlanta always draw people in. In fact, by show of hand, how many of you were born in the state of Georgia? How many of you were not born in the state of Georgia? in the 
the stock market, and some people uh, may utilize their stock market the way, well, cash it in, use it for down payment. That's a possibility. Rents, rents are beginning to rise. I'm from Washington, D.C. One may even say, Washington, D.C. is not really America uh, because all the artificial jobs and everything that going on. Uh, in fact, we have not suffered any recession. One walks around town, restaurants are full, people are smiling, they're toasting, everyone's happy in Washington. So in a sense, it's, it's not a reflection of what America is suffering throughout the country. Uh, however, uh, one thing that is occurring in Washington is, well, let me give you a, 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 the true uh, story. A few of my young staff last year did not buy a home. They missed out on a $1,000 tax credit. They said, well, I'm young, I'm not settled down. I want to buy a home someday, but not now. I'm not in a position. Those same people bought a home early this year. They said, what the heck is going on? You missed out on $8,000. I mean, you're the numbers guy. You should be doing the calculations and now you buy a home uh, after the tax credit is finished. What's going on here? And they said, well, we receive a, uh, a rental renewal notice and rents are rising 15%. So rising rents will quickly trigger some people who never thought about becoming a homeowner into pulling out the calculator, do the numbers to see whether or not it makes sense. Now, the rest of the country is not seeing 15% rent increases. Uh, so so uh, you know, rents are rising about 3 or 4% nationwide. But the fact that the rents are beginning to rise will be some trigger to push, nudge some qualified renters into thinking about buying a home. So again, improving factor. The other improving factor is that people feel comfortable buying distressed property provided the price is right. A couple of years ago when distressed property came onto the market, people would say, ooh, I don't want to buy that stuff. Uh, but now people are saying, I'm going to buy uh, because uh, they can quickly fix it up, uh, turn it around, possibly rent it out, and it cash flows uh, immediately. So people do not shy away from distressed property. And some markets, Vegas, Miami, those uh, hard hit regions, there's multiple bidding on distressed property. People we'll bring the property on, there are multiple bids going on. International buyers are uh, very strong in Florida market. Uh, surprisingly, Atlanta also gets some segment of the international buying. Uh, the weakening dollar has good news, bad news, uh, that there's many things attached to it. But one thing uh, is from an international buyer's perspective, it's much cheaper to buy real estate in the US. Uh, and also smart money appears to be now coming into the market. Smart money is always one step ahead of the general population. So the smart money is coming in, does that mean the general population will also begin to move? Uh, definition of smart money, I will discuss a little later. But there are some potential huge positive and potential huge negative, which also I will explore. Job market conditions, again, the job declines are over. It is a recovery. Even though it's a slow recovery, it's very, very slow recovery, but at least it's on the right path. Uh, after a recession, it should be three or four million job creation per year. We're getting one and a half million, about half the normal pace. North Dakota, housing market is fine. And you say, why is the housing market fine? Well, that's because they did not suffer any recession. It's moving. Texas. Governor Rick Perry is running for president on this. He is saying, I brought Texas to a full recovery. We suffer a recession, now the job market is fully recovering Texas. Michigan, structural change is not a two-year recession, it is a 10-year recession on the uh, recession uh, in Michigan. Atlanta, no recovery so far. This is puzzling. It is very puzzling why there is an economic recovery. It is the southern states that zoom. I mean, really advance much, much ahead of the rest of the country. Always coming out of the recession. Not this time. In fact, look at this chart. This is a long-term chart for Atlanta. Uh, the best book. So you hit a hard bump recently. But look at the long-term trend. 1970 to 2010, the job growth has nearly quadrupled, or maybe even more than quadrupled. So after this bumpy ride, assuming that it goes back to normal, just think how fast it would go uh, 
Detroit is the, the most populated uh, city. Uh, Chicago used to be, then it was LA. Uh, I would not be surprised 20 years from now, New York is number one in terms of population, and Atlanta is number two uh, in the country. So that would not be surprising at all. Uh, which also means that traffic is really, really bad. <laughs> I mean, it is bad already, but uh, very poor, even you know, a worsening condition. But it also means that as people come in, jobs have been created, look good, uh, return to the long term state. The real estate market will recover, uh, and there will be a continuous steady flow of, of people who need to buy a home. So uh, right now, Atlanta has a fast long term growth, uh, but it hit a very hard problem, and now it's trying to recover from that hard problem. One data that I monitor very closely is a weekly data that comes out every Thursday morning. Uh, and it is uh, data on how many people are filing for unemployment insurance, unemployment checks. This data shows how many people are filing for unemployment check for the very first time. And the red line is the part where it needs to go below. So, so right now, one sees that during the recession, the number of people filing for unemployment check really skyrocketed and it steadily declined, but even though it was above the red line, meaning that it, the economy was not improving, and it hit the red line, and I would have thought that it would just go continue to move down, but it got just stuck right there. And today's report, the latest weekly data came out was 417, so it's actually rising uh, above 400,000, uh, which is implying that the economy is still at a very shaky situation uh, today. But it needs to go down to that under 100,000 to say that we are back to a more normal situation uh, in the economy, and somehow it's not getting under that uh, 400,000. Financial market recovery, very strong from 2008, little volatility. So again, there is some little wealth recovery in the stock market, which may help on down payment for some people. I mean, many middle class that don't have sizable wealth in the stock market, but at least for some people, uh, this should, again, be that positive factor for uh, additional home sales. But housing equity has really not recovered. So after the bubble collapse, and it has really not recovered, and I will say that this is critical. Housing market equity recovery is critical because many small business owners, many small business owners cannot go to Wall Street and say, I want to issue Lawrence Yun bonds. No one will purchase that. That will not, a small business owner just cannot issue bonds to raise capital. You have to get money someplace else if you want to start a small business. Savings. Many small business owners actually tap housing equity to start their businesses. Some small business owner, nature of the small business, very dynamic. They try it out, it doesn't work. Others try it out and it can be very, very successful. Microsoft started out as a two people in garage. Before you know it, they have 60,000 employees. FedEx started as a very small company. Now global. Even at the turn of the century, General Electric, Thomas Edison, sweating it out, perspiring, now global multinational company. Uh, Disney, we think of Disney as Mickey Mouse, but there was actual Mr. Disney, uh, who during the Great Depression was drawing some cartoons and thought, hey, how do I make people happy during this time of uh, depression? And he came up with the characters, small business can big business. So we need to have a source of funding for small business. Many small businesses tap their housing equity, and right now housing equity is still not yet definitively stabilized, but we need to assure that it doesn't necessarily overcorrect and decline further. Things like mortgage interest deduction will worsen the housing equity situation, uh, and it will worsen the small business recoveries in the situation. Uh, rents rising, as I mentioned. Uh, home price in relation to rent. From the 1980 all the way to uh, about the year 2000, one for one, meaning that rent rises 3%, home values rise 3%, all one to one ratio. That housing market bubble period, things got out of whack. They corrected. One can see actually home values are over corrected. So if you just go back to the historical relationship, then home values should actually be recovering right now. But home values are not recovering uh, because 
residuals system. People who took out a mortgage, uh, this is the total figure, but people who took out a mortgage two years ago, last year, some of your clients bought a home last year, they are successful homeowners. They are not part of this graph. Their uh, delinquency rate is very, very low. But these are just the, the, the legacy impact of the credit mistake during the boom years. A distress sale uh, comprising right now about 30% of the market. I don't know what the situation here is in Atlanta, but uh, because of this chart, expect distress sales to remain high at least for the next couple of years. But that's part of the cleansing process. Distress property come onto the market. Uh, you need to absorb it uh, continuously. Now many media try to do their best in terms of reporting what is important for consumers. I mean, they have an admirable uh, a task, but sometimes they misinform. And I think one of the things they misinform is just to say, well, delinquency rates are very high, distressed property will be coming on, shadow inventory is coming on, uh, watch out, scary times ahead. What is not said is, uh, just think of that as a bathtub, water coming in to the bathtub. That's the distressed property coming in, shadow inventory coming into the market. However, uh, there is the, 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 the sinkhole where water is going out. This is the buyers taking out the, the inventory. Right now, the overall level of the water in the bathtub is actually declining, even though the inventories are coming in because there's slightly more buyers compared to the sellers. Uh, so, the, so it is part of the clearing up process. So just reporting on this is just only one half of the picture. It's not kind of the whole picture because uh, people are buying distressed property. Inventories are steadily being drawn down. This is the data related to the Fannie and Freddie Mac mortgages after 18 months in origination. So after 18 months, how is it performing by different vintage years? And 2009 vintage, people who took out a Fannie and Freddie loan in 2009, they are performing super well, very, very low default rate. They are successful homeowners. 2010 data is cut out. I talked to Fannie and Freddie. How is 2010 doing? Oh, better than 2009 in terms of lower defaults. So it is performing super well. And one of the reasons why it's performing super well is they're only giving it to the people with very high credit scores. Uh, if you lend it out to Oprah and Warren Buffett, yeah, you're going to get your money back. Um, but, but it's still not part of the social contract that we believe in America to say, well, not everyone is of you know, very high income, not everyone is of top credit score. So we need to provide some opportunity to get back to normal, and the normal will be about 3% default rate. Right now, at 1% default rate, that is not normal. Dollar weakening against other currencies, uh, which means that from foreigners' point of view, uh, it's much cheaper uh, to buy a US, US property. The foreign currency uh, carries a bigger weight. Smart money is a buying of all cash, People with money comprise one third of the transactions. Investors are coming in with all cash because investors cannot, cannot get mortgages. They don't want to bother with trying to get a mortgage or trying to deal with appraisals. Um, the financial market as asset recovery is certainly helping with their cash. Also, there are people who are buying real estate because they are saying that real estate can be a hedge against future inflation. I mentioned about printing of the money. Gold prices have come down in the past couple of days, but still much, much higher compared to what it was just five years ago, 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago, gold price was something like $200 per ounce. Today, after that two-day correction, it's about $1,700. So it goes from $200 to $1,700. Uh, and one of the reasons why people are buying gold is because they want to be protected against inflation. Real estate serves as a protection against inflation. Uh, one extreme example, Germany after World War I, they had to print money like crazy, they printed money like crazy, they had a hyperinflation. Everyone who saved money lost everything. Whatever they had in the bank, whatever they had in the financial market, they lost everything. Only Germans who had some level of financial stability were people who were owning real estate. So at least real estate held their values. Um, so the uh, U.S. were never going to hyperinflation, but high inflation, some high, higher inflation is a possibility, and some of the people are buying real estate as a potential hedge uh, against that inflation. Housing shortage, I mentioned about very low of housing
housing starts, new home construction, so assuming the population, job growth, return back to the normal pace, and we, we, if we are consistently underproducing, then at some point we can go into a housing shortage. So some investors are looking ahead and beginning to buy now while the prices are cheap. Uh, anecdotal stories, uh, I heard that uh, some of the parents are buying homes all cash for their kids. Those parents are saying, if I have that $120,000 sitting in the bank, what do I get? I get zero. If I buy a home $120,000 and have my kids pay me 6% mortgage rate, I get 6% more return. So we are going to see some parents buy their homes all cash for their kids uh, in order to get better return compared to the banks. Uh, and also, upper end market is beginning to move, uh, again, implying that perhaps the smart money is moving. General population is always one step behind the smart money. Uh, this is the chart showing real estate serving as an inflation hedge uh, historically. Only time it did not serve as an inflation hedge was during the boom years and the bust years. Those were artificial years. But now we are back to normal metrics regarding price to income, price to rent. So going forward, uh, real estate should serve as a hedge against inflation. Uh, here is the inflationary pressure consumer price index of 3.6. Producer price index, what the producers are paying for their product, it is up 7.2. Producer price index for intermediate products, up almost 12%. For crude early stage production, it is up 22%. Commodity prices up 38%, low prices at near around record high. All this implies that perhaps even the consumer prices are only up 3.6, which is actually uncomfortable from the Federal Reserve point of view. Pipeline inflationary pressure building that can eventually translate into higher consumer prices. Now, one thing about producer prices is that it's very volatile. It can go up a lot and it can go down a lot. So it tends to be more volatile. But so far, producer prices have been going up, up, and up without any downturn. Um, and one wonders whether or not this will eventually translate into higher consumer prices. Consumer confidence index, very low. So what is missing regarding the home buyer right now? Even those with finances as they lack confidence. So it remains low. 100 will be considered a more neutral level. Uh, given that now the election, presidential election campaign is underway, I also want to mention a historical, very good predictor from consumer confidence and presidential elections. If the consumer confidence index is above 100, the incumbent party gets reelected. If it's below 100, the incumbent party loses. This was created from about 1960 all the way to today. So what this means, well, only there was one time when it didn't work, and that was during the year 2000 election, when the consumer confidence was very high, and it implied that the incumbent party of Bill Clinton, meaning our Gore, should have easily won the election, yet George Bush won the election. So that was the only time where it didn't work, but some people may actually say, well, if you look at the popular vote, consumer confidence actually predicted that. Uh, but uh, irrespective of that, uh, if the election was held today, this is implying that President Obama is very vulnerable today. Uh, he's very vulnerable. Does President Obama have enough time? Does President Obama have enough time to get that uh, consumer confidence index to 100? And it's a very short time window. Only time we saw some fast consumer confidence recovery and within a 12-month or 16-month time span was President Reagan. So back in 1983, it looks like President Reagan was very vulnerable, but he made a quick turnaround uh, and was re-elected. So, but anyway, watch this as we go like regarding some predictor, predictive information about the uh, election next year. Upside potential. I mentioned about, about tight underwriting standards. Where's the proof? Where's the proof? Where's the proof? Your realtors are saying your clients cannot get along the work. But that's, those are just anecdotes. Show me the proof. But the proof is this. Fannie and Freddie credit scores. What is the average credit score of people getting Fannie and Freddie back mortgage? I mean, for example, your client is a loan 
bystanders. What if credit score become normal in terms of what is approved, loan approval, and you are looking at potentially 15 to 20 percent additional sales in the market? That means 15 to 20 percent additional absorption of inventory, faster recovery in home prices. Faster recovery in home prices means some uh, some housing equity gain that could be source of fund for some entrepreneurs who are thinking of starting a small business. Uh, so right now, the key is not about the mortgage rate, 4.4, 4.2, 4.8, that doesn't matter. What is critical is underwriting standards. Downside potential, policy change, QRM, qualified residential mortgage, which would could potentially place a 20% minimum down payment. People who are tough on this and begin to implement this very fast are the Republicans. The Republican Congress uh, uh, are saying, yeah, that makes sense, let's do a 20% down payment. And you should pose that question to uh, Senator Isaacson. Senator Isaacson may say 10% down payment looks reasonable, or he may say something like that. I completely disagree with 20% or 10%. What is critical is not the down payment. What is critical is people staying within their budget. If people stay within their budget, even with 3% down payment, 0% down payment, then loan will be successful. It will be successful. It is not about down payment. Uh, in fact, we have to remember FHA, VA products, 3.5% down payment FHA, VA, what's the down payment on VA loans, veterans affairs loans? Zero. So what happened to FHA and VA? There's something called Gini Bay, which you rarely hear, which actually does FHA and VA. This year, they made some internal profit. They turned that profit over to the Treasury, so it helped re modestly, modestly reduce the budget deficit. It never asked a single dime of taxpayers' money. Uh, yet people are saying 20% down payment is needed, uh, which doesn't make sense. Uh, they're thinking of uh, limiting mortgage interest reduction, as I mentioned. Lower loan limit, which means the Bank of America may not begin to issue loans that are considered jumbos or uh, charge very high interest rate. And also Fannie and Freddie need to be reformed for the fundamental change. The problem with Fannie, Fannie and Freddie was it had a very strange business model. It was a for-profit company that they had a taxpayer backing. Imagine you go to a bank and say, I want to borrow $1 billion. This nonsense. But what if you went to the bank and say, I want to borrow $1 billion, and if I don't pay back, the U.S. government will pay back? Well, then they will give you $1 million. But well, Fannie and Freddie had that back, and so they were able to borrow money, borrow money, borrow money, and create this huge hedge fund investment portfolio. During a good market, what do you know? Profits, huge bonus payments, everything worked out fine. During the bad years, heck, let the taxpayers pick up the tax. Uh, this model is fundamentally flawed and it should never resurface in that form. So, that, so, so the Fannie and Freddie, if they have a taxpayer backing, that means taxpayer responsibility and none of this hedge fund stuff that should ever uh, occur. So there will be some reform. Uh, I cannot discuss too much in detail about it. NAR has made a recommendation. Uh, and when the Fannie and Freddie reform takes place, I think next year or maybe two years from now, we want to ensure that this return of for-profit taxpayer a loss situation never uh, occurred again. This is a little photo that I took from my Blackberry. You can see actually my Blackberry on the photo. Uh, from the National Museum of American History. And what it says, you cannot read it, so I just pulled out two quotes. One was, uh, this is a museum of American history. You go through you know, World War I, World War II, Korean War, and then what happened to the veterans after the war. And here's a statement. Four million no-down payment VA for World War II veterans. Do you recall if we had a foreclosure crisis in the 1950s? We did. They were successful homeowners with zero down payments. And it also mentioned it fueled an unprecedented growth in America's middle class. A strong middle class is the foundation for stable democracy. We need to have a strong one. So again, this illustrates that 20% down payment, I'm not sure where they got that number, but clearly does not match up with the historical reality. It's all about staying within your budget and you will be fine. If you overstretch, something bad will happen. Uh, so my outlook is, uh, it looks like 
there's probability of recession, I would still say there is no recession, but no robust recovery either. So there will be some steady uh, recovery, one to one and a half annual job creation. Uh, mortgage rate, all the forces would indicate that we are already at a low point, but it does not mean that you know, changes in mortgage rate will be necessarily negative if the underwriting standard was to come back to normal. Again, the underwriting standard would be a game changer. Home values, I don't really see a strong movement in home values, you know, positive or negative. Small one percentage uh, changes, one, one single digit changes uh, over the next couple of years. Commercial market always follow the residential market. My final slide, uh, given the discussion of the uh, mortgage interest option and whatnot in Washington, in every one of our testimony, we put this quote in. One Democrat, one Republican, one person you like, one person you may not like. But clearly what we say during the 1900s, these two presidents were truly the transform, transformative presidents uh, of the past century. And FDR during World War II said, a nation of homeowners is uncomfortable. You are rooted in the community, and you're going to fight for your community. You look at Egypt, one study said in Egypt, 90% of people did not have a clear title to their residence. Something happens, it can quickly snowball into a revolution. In America, you have a solid majority of people who own their property. This assures that we have a stable society. Ronald Reagan came to came to NAR convention during the tax reform. There was a lot of discussion about tax reform deficit back then. He came out speaking to the real audience and said, we will preserve part of the American dream which the mortgage interest deduction symbolizes, which is the reason why mortgage interest deduction remains the same for the past hundred years. Uh, because there's people are talking about well, it's like $20 billion here, but I think the transformative president clearly in this is not really about the dollar figures, it's about America, who we are. And we want to have a solid majority of people owning their homes, provided that it is a sustainable home ownership, successful home ownership. We don't want to return to a bubble state and a crash situation, but we want we don't want to overreact uh, from the uh, recent mistakes. So so with that, uh, there may be some emails coming your way regarding call to action about mortgage interest reduction and others. Sometimes it looks very complicated, but in reality what it is is you do two clicks. Click, click, and that letter goes to your member of Congress to say how you view regarding mortgage interest deduction or various housing policies. If you disagree, that's fine. You don't have to say it. Everyone has right to disagree, but if you agree with that, it's not a, it's, it's not burdensome. It's very two clicks, uh, and responding to those emails will greatly facilitate that we protect 